1993, Bill Murray played the character of Phil Connors in the movie Groundhog Day. Reliving February the 2nd over and over and over again. Every morning, he wakes up to Sonny and Cher singing, I got you, babe, again and again and again. What does he try to do to escape the inescapable repetitiveness of the same old, same old? He looks for happiness in all kinds of experiences. He attempts all sort of activities in his quest to try to find meaning in life. He launches himself into every pleasure. If it feels good, do it. He gorges himself on a table filled with food. He drinks coffee straight from the literal coffee pot at a restaurant. He punches out a guy that annoys him. And he seduces a woman into sleeping with him, living unrestrained by his passions. He turns to greed. He robs an armored car, and he uses the money to buy the car of his dreams and the wardrobe he's always wanted, only to find those things empty as well. He turns to despair. He takes his life over and over again, but he always ends up back at February the 2nd with Sonny and Cher singing, I got you, babe. He turns to knowledge. He turns to accomplishments. Maybe that will give him a sense of meaning and escape this monotony. He, he becomes an accomplished uh, jazz pianist. He, he learns how to uh, both read and recite French poetry. He becomes an ice sculptor. He betters himself and still feels empty and hopeless. I've been studying the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes for quite a few months now. And over and over again, in moments like that, here's what I say. That's so Ecclesiastes. Groundhog's Day is so Ecclesiastes. Have you ever been there? Maybe in the midst of the suffering of life, you're like again and again and again. Like some of you are like, I washed the dishes yesterday. Where did this come from? I know not a lot of you don't do dishes. You washed your car yesterday and you go to it and you're like, it's dirty already or suffering. And you're like, something else or success. And you got there, you got the job, you got the girl, you got the car, you got the raise. And you're like, is this all there is? It still feels empty. What, what do you do with the meaninglessness? What do you do with the emptiness of life? And we're launching in for the next three months, going chapter by chapter through this Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes to try to say, what is it about this book that makes it, number one, fit into scripture, but that helps us make sense of today? And I think there's a ton, and so I, I really am excited about this, but I, I want to be excited for the right reasons. So I want to do something. I want to say, would you, would you read Ecclesiastes? Would you this week... Just read chapter one. We, we've created a journal for some of you. You could get this journal, unless they've ran out. I don't know if they've ran out. You can read, you can write your thoughts. You, there's other scripture to try to put it in context. Um, sometimes around here I say things like this. Hey, if you get any time, why don't you read Ecclesiastes? Can I say it differently today? Read Ecclesiastes. <laughs> like read it and say, God, would you speak to me through this? God, would you guide me and help me to... Find perspective in life as I, as I read. I, I wanna do something different today. I wanna give context. And so there's a little bit of uh, introduction that I need to do. I won't do this every week. So if you're new here, I don't do this every week, but this is context to help us make sense of Ecclesiastes. So look at this. Ecclesiastes fits into the Old Testament wisdom literature. Primarily, there's three books that fit in that category, Song of Solomon a little bit, but Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and, and Job, not Job, Job. Uh, Proverbs is, gives principles of wisdom. If you live with wisdom, most often this is how things turn out. Now listen, Proverbs doesn't give promises if you do this, this, and this, this will turn out. Some of us historically have read these passages like if uh, you train up a child in the way they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. That's a principle that happens occasionally, but sometimes it doesn't. These aren't promises, they're principles. Ecclesiastes, as we're going to see, is often when Proverbs turns out the way that we didn't want it to. 
Uh, I heard one person say, Proverbs is like the weather forecast, Ecclesiastes is the actual weather. Now, you don't get it because you're from Southern California, but in North Carolina, the forecast would be, it may snow tomorrow. Everybody shuts down. Uh, We're so excited as school children because we're like, we're gonna wake up to a yard filled with snow and we'll go sled, and we wake up in the morning and there's no snow because in North Carolina, meteorologists are wrong more than they're right. But we still got out of school, so that was still a good day. Uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and then there's Job, the story of a a wise man, a righteous man, a good man who still suffers. Uh, One of the prayer team members told me that she heard a podcast, didn't even plan on listening to this, this week, and it says, Ecclesiastes is is what happens when Proverbs and Job gets married and has a baby. (laughs) It's complicated. Sometimes it's confusing, so I want to address, there's some debates that go on around Ecclesiastes. Look at this debate. There's a debate. I think there's a debate on Ecclesiastes. There we go, how to understand the book. Is it cynical wisdom that should be avoided? Is it just like, listen, my spiritual gift is cynicism and sarcasm. You're like, is that what it is? Cynical wisdom that should be avoided. Others look at it positively as a book of realism focused on joy. And it is real, but you have to work to find the joy in it. Here's why I'm putting that up there. If you read it and you feel a little bit confused, so are scholars. They can't even agree on what the purpose is. That's what happens when you read a book that's thousands of years old and you're acting like it was written yesterday. It takes some work, some prayer to go through it. Also, there's debates on Ecclesiastes about who wrote it. Was it Solomon, another descendant of David, an Israelite teacher using a Solomon-like approach. If you're interested at all, go to Bible Project or just Google Bible Project Ecclesiastes. There are a couple of videos that are so amazing. I highly recommend it. Here's the debate. Ecclesiastes never specifically says the name of the person who wrote it. So some people are confused. Is it this? Uh, some people even say part of it's just Solomon writing in third person or first person. And we love it when somebody writes third person and talks about Aaron and Aaron did this and Aaron did that. So we're trying to make sense of where does this all come from? So to do that, look at Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse one. It starts like this. The words of the teacher, the son of David, King in Jerusalem. So that's the intro of like who's writing it, but it doesn't specifically tell us who it is. And and interestingly enough, I think that word teacher, which is in the NIV translation that I teach from, is maybe even better translated preacher. Let me give you the context. Preacher specifically addresses a person who is talking to a congregation, a group of people, an assembly about the things of God. So don't think of this as like a science teacher in the eighth grade and you've got a beaker and they're telling you what to do with all that. Like this isn't that kind of thing. Preacher is probably a better translation. It's somebody with a gathering of people talking about the things of God. Ecclesiastes is this sort of English word that we have that is really similar to a word in the New Testament for church, ecclesia. Ecclesia is the church, a gathering of people. Ecclesiastes is a preacher to the people of God, pointing them towards God. So it's the preacher, the the one who is teaching the words of God. But Ecclesiastes is a different kind of teacher, a different kind of preacher, maybe one that we're not all that familiar with. Sometimes he maybe sounds a, a little bit strange because we like sermons that encourage, and I want to try to do that. We like sermons that celebrate, and I'm going to try to do that. We want sermons that comfort, but sometimes we need to be discomforted before we can be comforted, right? It's like, uh, one uh, commentator said, it's like Ecclesiastes has a little bit of an accent. And as one who has been told from time to time that they have an accent, I like accents. But when someone has a thick accent, it causes you to lean in and listen even more carefully to make sense of what they say. And for our ears, Ecclesiastes will sound a little bit different. Ready for an example? Chapter one, verse two. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Okay, close your Bibles, let's go home. Can you imagine that? Like, we're done. We're done here. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. It's utterly, utterly meaningless. 
This is a theme that will be continued throughout the, the book of Ecclesiastes. But here's the question. What does it mean? Look at this. What does meaningless mean? Used about 38 times in Ecclesiastes. Literal. The literal translation is vapor, smoke, or breath. Meaningless is the idea of you, you, you have smoke and it's right there and you try to grab it and it just goes through your hands. It refers to emptiness, an unsatisfactory condition in life. Figuratively, it means vanity or meaningless, which are probably the most uh, popular translations of this word. 38 times in Ecclesiastes, we get this idea of this is what meaninglessness is. This is what it looks like when you go after life with everything in it, and it still feels empty. Or it still feels like you, you're trying to grasp something that you can't quite hold on to. There's, there's two sort of ditches, two errors of interpreting Ecclesiastes we need to be careful of. The one is like from this existential idea, this nihilism. Let me give you a definition I found of nihilism. It's a view of traditional values and beliefs are unfounded, they, their existence is useless, and it's no help whatsoever. So traditional teachings, traditional uh, thinking, uh, traditional values, they don't even matter. So do whatever you want to do. Everything is relative. It's the band queen singing, nothing really matters. Nothing really matters to me. It's when we're looking at success that can blind us and saying, but wait a minute, it may be empty. Or it's when we're facing suffering that distracts us and gives us a despair. But it's also in moments of boredom and monotony. Do you, do, you, do you understand in this age, most people hate boredom and we're constantly distracted so we don't have to be bored. So what happens? Look at this quote I found. I love this. Derek Kidner warns in his commentary, The Message of Ecclesiastes, triviality is more stifling than tragedy and the shrug is the most hopeless of all comments on life. Some of you would say today, I'm not really in a successful season and I'm not really in a, a suffering season. But the question is, are you in a shrugging season? Would you just shrug with me one time? Like, let's just act it out. Hmm. Some, of us, some of us have grown apathetic and indifferent to this world. Triviality is more stifling than tragedy. The shrug is the most hopeless comments of all. And it's, Ecclesiastes is here to shake us, to say, step out of this, wake up and be a part of what God wants to do. And so there's this, this error of saying everything is meaningless means nothing has any meaning. That's not what it means. And so just do whatever you want to. But the other side of the ditch, the other thing to be careful of is to get too spiritual and too religious, too quick, and always try to just say, it's all about happy, happy, happy. Some of us are like, I don't know that I want to read Ecclesiastes because it makes me sad. And I don't want to be sad. Maybe you need to face the reality of the world, though. And so there's a ditch that says, let's just spiritualize everything. Let's have like a, a cliche for everything. And we don't really have to face up to anything. But the great reformer Martin Luther said that this noble little book should be read every day because it rejects religious sentimentality. Here, here's the way that I phrase it. A good reminder for us, look at this. We need to be willing to honestly face the realities of this life in this world. To not be overly concerned every time of escaping and avoiding pain, but to honestly face the realities of this life. And so we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the problem of evil. We're gonna talk about death and eternity and judgment. We're gonna talk about the emptiness of riches and pleasure and accomplishments because there's something deeper to be rediscovered in those moments. We're gonna talk about things that make us uncomfortable, but we're gonna talk about what God wants to do in our lives. And I, but I just want, to, I want us to sort of confront this. A lot of us, this approach is not ours. The approach of Ecclesiastes is not like ours. A lot of us, we want instantaneous answers. If we've got a question, we want clarity. Make it clear. Make it direct. Tell me what I need to hear, right? Ecclesiastes doesn't always give easy answers, but it does give wisdom for living in every situation. A lot of times what we want are hurried responses. Don't delay. We need an answer and we need it quick. But can I just tell you, 
God is not in a hurry. God's not in a hurry. And we need to trust his timing. And often, if I'm being honest, I like, we like simple solutions. Can you just tell me one, two, three, I'll do that. We'll get through this problem. It'll be good and we move on. And the complex problems of life and of this world don't have simple solutions. And there's not necessarily an answer for everything. This will tell you a lot about me. Probably my theme verse for the last 15 years has been this. In this world, you will have trouble. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's good news, right? Well, I don't know. It depends on what part are you talking about, the trouble part or the overcoming part? The, the reality is we, we need to be able to face honestly the realities of this life. And Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. Not an if, it's a when, it will come. But take heart, have confidence, be courageous. I have overcome the world. And even what we're told later is Jesus leads us to be overcomers even in the midst of this world. It is amazing news. But here's what stuck out to me this week in a fresh way that I haven't seen in a while. This word, you. In this world, you, and if we're not careful, we're sitting in church this morning and we're thinking you means me, you doesn't mean me, you means y'all. It's not are you having trouble or you having trouble or you having trouble, it's are any of us having trouble? That's why the Apostle Paul would say rejoice with each other when you rejoice and grieve with each other when you grieve. It's not enough to say my life's going good, I'm fine. I don't know what their problem is if we're in this together. In this world, you collectively are going to face trouble, but you all together can take heart because I have overcome the world. And what Jesus is inviting us into, and I think what Ecclesiastes is inviting us into, is we can look into the face of suffering or the face of success or the face of monotony and boredom and say, I can't find meaning in that alone, but I can look to God. We'll get here in a minute, but I can look to God and find meaning and rediscover purpose in the midst of this world. And to accept not deny or avoid the reality. There is pain, but there is still hope. There are hard times, but God is still faithful. And we wanna trust him and go after him. I, I, I've heard two comments recently, I gotta hurry. John Mark Comer in his book, Practicing the Way, says this, there is something in evangelical Christianity that is profoundly dishonest when we won't look into the reality of the pain of this world. And I was like, ouch, because I am one of those, and he is too. But then I also heard Jerry Seinfeld at a Duke uh, University commencement address. And he said this, and I was sort of blown away. I don't know what he means, but I know what I take from it. This is what Seinfeld said. We are embarrassed in this day and age. We are embarrassed over things we should be proud of. And we are proud of things we should be embarrassed of. And I was like, whoa. I heard both of those things. And here's what I said. That's so Ecclesiastes. <laughs> That's so Ecclesiastes. We're, we're embarrassed over things we should be proud of and proud over things we should be embarrassed of. And can I just say, and that happens on both sides of whatever issue you're thinking through. So how do we face life in that situation? Look at verse 12. Now we have the teacher speaking either as a unique voice, a different voice, or in now the first person. I, the teacher was king over Israel in Jerusalem. See, that's what he says. He doesn't say, I'm Solomon, so we're not 100% sure. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Listen to this. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. That's his conclusion. Life can be hard. There's burden. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and all of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Let's leave that up there for just a second. He says, I've seen all the things that are done. Whoever this person is, Solomon or whoever, has great experience, great wisdom, great perspective, learned a lot of lessons. I've seen all of the things done under the sun. First phrase, that will be repeated time after time after time. Under the sun simply means this, while you're alive, right here, right now on this earth. It's the temporary things 
compared to the eternal things. It's the earthly things compared to the heavenly things. All the things done under the sun. Again, we'll talk about work, pleasure, uh, knowledge, all that kind of stuff under the sun. All of them are meaningless. Meaningless like a vapor or meaningless like empty. A chasing after the wind. A chasing after the wind will be repeated over and over and over again. Have you ever chased after the wind? It doesn't really work that way. In a month or two, chase after the Santa Ana. See how that works out for you. You can chase your trash cans, but you can't chase the, the wind. And what, what he's saying there is there's this like fruitlessness. There's this like striving to no end that it doesn't really work out that well for you. You keep going and going. You keep going after something. And there's still disappointment. You're striving and yet there's unmet expectations. You're striving, maybe you even achieved, and there's an emptiness. Maybe you felt this through a diagnosis from a doctor. Maybe you have felt this when things that you wanted to happen, you prayed for them to happen, they didn't. Maybe it's in betrayal of someone you trusted. Or maybe it's you got the job, the raise, the person, the car, the whatever, and you're like, is this all there is? Vanity, meaninglessness, when used in Ecclesiastes, half of the occurrences are about things like pleasure, achievement, work, politics, the general randomness of life, chance is the word used here. It's not talking about sometimes what meaningless means or this vanity is talked about the quote unquote religious things, the spiritual things. This is about practical things. And rediscovering our purpose, what we've called this series and what it's all about, is not about you have to quit everything and start over from, from scratch. It's about recovering purpose on Monday morning because you got a new perspective on Sunday. Which reminds me of this, number two. We need to remember we cannot understand the middle of the story apart from the end. I could add, or the beginning. We need to remember we cannot understand the middle of the story apart from the end. Let me, let me just do this. What, what if we had a homework assignment and the homework assignment was this? Everybody, let's go home today and let's watch a movie. Let's watch a movie we know nothing about. We don't know any of the people. We have no context. And let's watch the movie starting in the very middle of the movie and you can only watch five minutes. And then you've got to figure out what the movie is about. Can you do that? Probably not. If you're in the middle of a story and all you get is five minutes, you have no idea what happened before to get to that point, do you? But what happened before matters. It's significant to get to that point. But if you also watch only the first five minutes, you have no idea how it ends. And like almost every single movie that comes from Hollywood, that it is all tied up with a bow in the last five minutes and everything is good, 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 even though it was bad, bad, bad an hour ago. If you don't know the end of the story, you don't know how to make sense of the middle of the movie in those five minutes. And here's what I wanna remind you of. Whether it's trying to make sense of Ecclesiastes without the context of scripture, or whether it's trying to make sense of the, the moment you're in right now, you can't really make sense of it without the beginning and the end of the story. And one of the things that I believe with all of my heart is God has given us scripture as a revelation of who he is and how he has worked from creation, the beginning, to eternity, even the maps and the table weights of measures. I don't even know what that's, but he has got, given us guidance. He's given us a comprehensive story of creation to eternity and that one day God is going to make everything that has been broken and unjust. He's going to bring restoration and a fulfillment of all things. He's going to fulfill every hope and dream. He's going to restore all the broken things and without knowing that, I can't make sense of the suffering or the success of right now. But knowing that, builds a confidence, it builds a hope. When it feels like I am done and ready to throw in the towel, whoa, 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 don't forget the end of the story. Or when I have a tendency to take pride, look what I have done, whoa, 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 whoa. Remember the end of the story, the best is yet to come. And it builds a hope and a confidence in our God. 
His scriptures are given all over the place. Here's just four examples that are given to give us perspective. In Romans 8, Paul says, our suffering, our present suffering, we've got to remember it in light of the glory that is to come. The, the brokenness that you may be in right now, the hard situation you may be in right now, that, that we are living in right now, you only can really understand it when you compare it with the glory that is to come in eternity. In Colossians 3, Paul says, set your minds and your hearts on things above, not on earth. Because if you don't, you're just chasing the wind over and over again. But set your minds and your hearts on things above. That's why Jesus says, we pray to God that your, uh, your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying in light of eternity. We're praying in light of heavenly things. First Peter 5, 10 after suffering, God will restore us and make us strong. And you're like, but I may be in suffering and I don't feel strong. But it says, after suffering, God will restore us and make us strong. You know what he doesn't do? He doesn't time stamp that. So for some of us, after suffering, we will die and we will go to be with Jesus and he will restore us and make us strong. And so, that's a promise that we hold on to. And for others, after suffering, there's a season and we get through that season here on earth and God will make us strong. But we don't know the end from the middle. And living with heavenly wisdom and not earthly wisdom is what James talks about that will inform how we can try to have perspective and make sense and wisdom to live right here, right now. Is there any place in your life recently that you have thought, it really is meaningless. It really is hopeless. Is there any area that despair has fought for your attention? Maybe robbed you of your faith. We need this voice of Ecclesiastes maybe to make us a little bit uncomfortable. Especially in our days of echo chambers and algorithms where we can be deceived into thinking, everybody thinks like I think. You want me to show you? I'll show you my Facebook. Everybody believes like I believe. Read Twitter. The question is, are you being shaped by Scripture? Are you being formed by the truth that God has, not the opinions of other people? Because my fear is a lot of us are misguided by our own assumptions. It's, it's no different than the old days when you didn't have ways and you didn't even have a paper mat, map and you asked somebody for directions and they gave you directions and they were wrong. And you're like, do I blame them or do I blame me for trusting them? We're misguided by that. We're more informed, some of us, by American values than biblical values. We need scripture to shape us and form us into who God wants us to be so we can be led to hope. But listen, hope in the right places. Misplaced hope is a hope that's not in God, but it's in something else. Be that success, winning, pleasure, money, politics, any kind of success that's not built in God. God is it actual success. Get to the end of this story, um, literally, Ecclesiastes 12. So we read chapter one apart. Let's read a, one verse out of chapter 12 that you'll hear us come back to in this series time after time after again. We're taking one chapter every week and going through it for the next 12 weeks. But when you get to the end of chapter 12, there is context. There is a little bit of a, of a, of a guiding light for our path. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, here's what the writer writes. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. If you're in school right now and you're learning how to write a paragraph that is a conclusion sentence, that's how you start it. Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. That's a wrap up for sure. What do we do? Two things, fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. Just leave that up for a second. Fear God and keep his commandments. Now, if you're new to scripture, you could read fear God and maybe the only context you have is like a horror movie or a haunted house and you're like, no thanks. Biblically, fear is reverence also. 
This is not fear God, be terrified of who he is because scripture reveals he is a good God. He is gracious and compassionate, but he is also a sovereign God and he knows all things. Uh Uh-oh. But fear is not something that would make us afraid to run from him. Fear is a reverence that draws us to him. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God. We're, we're told in Proverbs chapter one, here's the importance of the fear of God. Put, put Proverbs one up here. The, the importance of the fear of God is this. It's the beginning of knowledge. If we don't have the right relationship, the right response, the right category for who God is, we won't fear him in a reverent way. We want to run from him. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you really want knowledge, it starts with the right perspective, a right relationship with God. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The person who looks at this and is like, this is ridiculous. I don't want anything to do with it. That. It says it's a foolish way to live. When God is wanting to give us wisdom and instruction to help us live and make sense of this world. For us not to argue, but God, I've got my way and you've got your way and I'll mostly go your way except for the things that I care about the most, I'll go my way. No, 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 no. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. God wants us to have this kind of knowledge, to trust him, to, to live for him. He says first, fear God, a right reverence relationship to God. Secondly, keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. So what does that mean? I mean, on one level, it means there are very clear commands. In the Old Testament, very clearly, there's 10 commandments. The religious leaders took those 10 and they dissected them and they added to them and they got like 600 plus little commandments. Do this, do this, do this. We've talked about this a lot here, but when you get to the New Testament, Jesus summarizes. The apostle Paul, Peter, they summarize the commands. What are the commands of God? I'll get to that in just a second. But here's the point and here's what we'll come back to time and time again. Look at this. We need to be reminded that everything is meaningless. It's empty. It doesn't fulfill. Everything is meaningless, dot, 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 without Jesus. We need to be reminded everything is meaningless, and yet Jesus came to bring purpose and meaning and fulfillment. He came to fulfill all of the things the Old Testament had pointed to. And so when we then begin to see the very words of Jesus, here's what we see, the difference of meaningless versus purpose. Look at this in John 15. Jesus gives an invitation into the kind of life he wants us to live. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Meaning, Jesus is the source and we are found our life in him. And he says, if you, will you say that word with me? Remain in me and I in you. You will bear much fruit. Whatever definition of success we have, here's what I want to direct us to. This is Jesus' definition of success. Living in this world bearing fruit. Like we're the kind of tree that he wants us to be bearing the fruit. What kind of fruit? Well, that's easy. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, faithfulness, those things. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Bearing fruit, but check this out, apart from... From me, you can do nothing. Apart from, this would be the ecclesia, this would be the, that's so Ecclesiastes. Apart from me, it's meaningless. But with me, there's purpose. There's fruitfulness. Our lives are beneficial, not for ourselves alone, beneficial to others Apart from me, you can do nothing. But the good news is, in you, we can bear much fruit. Look at the next part of this. John John 15, verse 10. If, if, that's important. If you keep my commands, there's the commands. What commands? You'll, You'll see in just a second. If you keep my commands, you will, there's the word again, remain. It's staying close to Jesus. You will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and I remain in his love. Here's what Jesus is saying. I am doing the will of the Father. I'm remaining in his love because we're one. If you keep my commands, that will happen to you. Verse 11, 
I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. This is again the opposite of meaningless. My joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. You're not empty because Jesus fills you, verse 12. And then he says this, my command is this. How clear is that? So when Ecclesiastes ends and it says there's two things to do, fear God and keep his commands. Fear God and keep his commands. Well, fear God is this right relationship, a reverence to God, keep his commands. What? Jesus says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. This is what Jesus is commanding us to do. Receive his love so that we can respond to other people in his love. It's the fulfillment of Ecclesiastes. It's, it's like the practical application of what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying. If we don't want to be trapped in a life that is leading to emptiness, it's because we're being rooted and shaped by Jesus and his way. And it's an alternative to this world's way of living it's, it's not everybody for themselves. It's not everybody figure out your own way. It's God has revealed his ways to us most clearly in Jesus and we want to become more Christ-like. It's a different kind of response. It's refusing to give in to whoever they want you to be, whoever they want you to be, whatever they're saying, whatever they're saying. What is Jesus saying? And who is he trying to shape us into? Uh, Leslie Newbegin was this amazing missionary in, into India many years ago, and he is, is a writer that has just inspired many, many others to be a missionary, to follow Jesus in all kinds of places in this world. <coughs> when he was an older man, he was back um, off the mission field, and he was interviewed. And in this interview, the, the, the person on the radio said, Bishop Newbegin, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Like, what if somebody asked you that question? What would you say? They said to him, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And his response was this. I am neither an optimist or a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And it was like, wait a minute, I didn't ask that. Like, no, 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 here's what you need to understand. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You need to hear, I'm not falling into your categories. Here's my category. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That's the way that we're going to go. So when Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, he's, he's being real. He's saying, I want you to understand this. But he's saying, don't be swayed by them, whoever they are. Here's what you need to know. Take heart, I have overcome the world. And yeah, meaninglessness, whether that means vanity, vapor, emptiness, whatever. That's what life is apart from Jesus, but with Jesus. There is meaning, there is purpose to be discovered. And there is fruit that he wants our lives to bear together for the glory of his name and the good of this world. Maybe you're here today and you would say, I don't know what this life with Jesus is even like. All I see is despair. And all I feel is hopelessness. Or... All I feel is an emptiness even though I have so much. Maybe today is a day of salvation for you. If you've never turned to Jesus, today could be that day. Others of us are Christians and we're like, I, 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 I have believed and yet there's been a long season of going my own way. And maybe today is a day of turning back to the ways of God and turning back to Jesus as the center of my life. Would you pray with me? I'm just gonna ask you in this room at least, would you close your eyes as we pray? And Is there anybody here that as you have been here for the last, whatever, hour or so, God has been speaking to you and you're coming to this realization, I need Jesus in my life and I don't have him, but I want him. Not just like his gifts, but you want Jesus in your life. I don't have a magical prayer for you to pray, but I have a simple cry of the heart if that's who you are. I would love to pray for you more than anything. If that's you, would, you would, and you would say, Aaron, pray for me because I, I, I know Jesus isn't in my life, but I desire him to be in my life and maybe today's a turning point. Would you just raise your hand so I could pray for you wherever you are? God bless you, God bless you. Anybody else? 
God bless you. God bless you. Maybe this prayer would be a prayer that you resonate with, that you would say, dear Jesus, I need you. Please forgive me of my sin. I, I, I give you my life. Maybe you would even pray, I don't have all the answers, but I believe in you. And you would just simply pray, Jesus, I give you my life. Is there anybody, just with our eyes closed, anybody that would say, Aaron, I prayed that prayer. I mean that with everything in me. Even though I don't understand it fully, would you pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand if that's you? God bless you. 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 In just a moment, our prayer team is going to come up front. I want to strongly encourage you to, before you rush out of here, to take a moment to let a prayer team member pray for you, to be with you in a, in a moment of decision like this. But before we do that, others of you, you, you would say, I'm a Christian, and yet I, if I'm being honest, I've been going my own way. I've been trying to live even by the wisdom of this world. I've been distracted chasing the wind. And I want to come back today to that right place, that right relationship with God through Jesus. And you would just say, Aaron, pray for me as I, I'm sort of at a turning point moment where some changes need to happen in my life. Aaron, would you pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand if that's you? That you would say, God, my hand's all over the place. God bless you. You would say, God, I am turning back to you. God, would you bring grace? Would you bring forgiveness? God, would you help my, my friends here as they're saying, I I know what needs to be done and it's the turning back to you, Jesus. So maybe some of you would just have to, if you're being honest, saying, I've been living this unrestrained life. And it's empty. And you would say, God, please forgive me. Coming back to you. God, would you move in this place, move in our lives but not just on Sunday morning. God, as we leave this place, that we would be different, that we would act differently, think differently. You would transform us from the inside out and God, bring us back to you. We wanna be with you, Jesus. So have your way, we pray. In Jesus' name, all God's people say with me, amen.